Preparing yourself for a baseball season is a year-round process. From June through October, your training should be of moderate intensity and you should aim to perfect your technique in areas such as acceleration, top speed, lateral movement, and overall body rhythm. This can be accomplished by focusing on an individual Speed City product for three to four weeks and then switching to a new product for three to four weeks. When you hit the months of November and December, it's time to kick your training into high gear. This is when you use Speed City's Sack Attack training routine. This three day a week, six week routine will be the most intense training cycle of the entire year and will address every skill you need to succeed as a baseball player. Sack Attack is built on a three day a week, six week training platform. It is designed to be used on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Each workout begins with a 10 minute dynamic warm up routine designed to raise the body's core temperature in preparation for the upcoming workout. The exercises used are also designed to target basic movement technique as well as balance, rhythm, and body control. The warm up routine is demonstrated in the dynamic warm up section of this video. Monday's routine targets linear speed. Here you will find drills that teach acceleration and top speed sprint mechanics. The goal of Monday workouts is to develop blazing straightaway speed, like that used when sprinting around the bases, running down fly balls in the outfield, or when getting timed in the 60-yard dash. Primary equipment used includes the quick foot ladder, hand weights, and the rocket rope or speed builder. Wednesday's workouts target jumping skills. Most of the exercises on this day will involve weighted or resisted jumps and throws. Jumping skills are critical to baseball players because they directly influence the athlete's ability to explode out of a stop position and to quickly accelerate into a sprint. Primary equipment used on Wednesdays includes the quick foot ladder, the viper, and jelly balls. Friday's workouts target lateral speed and change of direction skills. These workouts tend to be a lot of fun because they involve several games where athletes compete against one another. Primary equipment used includes the quick foot ladder, the sidewinder, and the viper. Each workout during the week ends with a short cool down segment. This portion of the workout is geared to target the core muscles in the stomach and lower back and general flexibility through static partner stretching. Before you get started on the sack attack routine, there are a few other important points to cover. First, the sack attack routine is not an easy routine. Athletes must possess a solid conditioning base before starting this routine and should not use sack attack as a means to get themselves in shape. Second, this routine is designed to get progressively harder from week to week and each workout builds on the last. Thus, it is extremely important that athletes not miss workouts. Finally, there are two golden rules to follow when performing the sack attack routine. Number one, Every repetition must be perfect. Sloppy training habits will only result in sloppy performances during a game. Number two, once perfection is achieved, each repetition must be performed at full speed. Athletes don't get fast by training slow, so everything must be kept in high gear. By following these guidelines and completing all 18 workouts in the sack attack routine, an athlete will experience significant gains in speed, agility, and quickness. The Viper is an outstanding training aid, but it is also one that requires athletes and coaches to practice certain safety precautions at all times. First, under no circumstances is the Viper designed for horseplay. Many of the drills conducted with the Viper involve stretching the 8-foot flexicord. The tension that is placed on the Viper's flexicord is capable of numerous unique training benefits, but it is also capable of causing injury if misused. Coaches and athletes using the Viper must understand that they are engaged in serious training and not casual play. Second, the Viper's flexicord is 8 feet long and is designed to be stretched to a maximum distance of 20 feet. Overstretching the flexicord could cause the flexicord to rupture or could cause components of the belt or handle attachment to break due to excess force. To avoid unintentional overstretching, cones marking the maximum stretch limit should be used at all times. 
It should be noted that some Viper drills cover more than 20 feet, but in such circumstances, the anchor athlete is moving with the athlete being trained so that separation is never more than 20 feet. The Viper's flexicord is designed to be attached to the padded Viper waist belt and or the Viper handle strap. No other devices should be used to secure either end of the flexicord. When attaching the flexicord to the waist belt, only one end of the flexicord should be attached to any of the individual metal rings at one time. Both ends of the flexicord may be secured to separate metal rings at the same time, but not to the same metal ring at one time. Athletes and coaches should inspect the attachment points on the waist belt before each use for signs of wear or damage. If either is discovered, the belt should not be used. When only one end of the flexicord is attached to the Viper's waist belt, the other end must be secured to the Viper's attachment handle. This handle may be wrapped around a sturdy stationary object like a goal post, worn around the waist of a second athlete, or held in the hand of a second athlete. When this third method is used, the athlete should insert his or her hand through the handle's loop and then firmly grasp the strap. Athletes wearing the Viper's waist belt must be conscious of how they connect the front buckle. The male end of the buckle should be inserted straight into the female end so that both teeth on the male end click into place. If the athlete does not connect the buckle properly, only one of the teeth will click into place and may cause the buckle to come unfastened during use. Finally, like all Speed City products, the Viper comes with a one-year warranty. However, proper care may extend the useful life of the product. It is recommended that the entire Viper product be cleaned free of all dirt and debris after each workout and stored in a climate-controlled environment away from harsh sunlight. Following these simple guidelines will help ensure that you get the most out of training with your new Viper from Speed City. Performing ankle flips, the athlete will keep a straight line from their heels to the top of their head. The athlete's knees stay locked and the only thing that touches the ground is the ball of their foot. A slight forward lean and a quick flick of the ankle are all that propel the body forward. This motion is designed to make the athlete more keenly aware of the placement of their body weight on the front of their foot and of the proper positioning of keeping the toe pulled towards the shin. To loosen the upper body, athletes will perform arm circles. In this exercise, the athlete will circle their arms from front to back, flexing all the muscles in the upper body and trying to keep their elbows together as long as possible. Athletes should progress forward slowly enough to complete about four to five circles in a 10 yard distance. Athletes should remain on the front of their feet and bounce through the entire movement rather than walk. When performing shin grabs, an athlete should maintain an upright posture, grab their shin, and pull it deep into their chest. Pulling the body into this position and then holding the position for a second requires tremendous flexibility and body control. As athletes hold this position, they should also aim to support all of their weight on the front of their foot and not on their heel. After pausing at the top of the motion, the athlete will release their leg, step forward with it, and then repeat with the other leg. Russian walks target hamstring flexibility. Athletes should keep their legs straight at all times during this drill. As one leg kicks straight in front of the body, the other leg should also remain straight and the athlete should maintain an upright posture. The athlete should aim to kick as high as possible, but not at the expense of bending the knee. When the leg is fully extended in front of the body, the athlete will reach out and touch their toes with the opposite hand. A skips focus on rhythm and correct sprint angles. Key points to a successful A skip include an upright posture, 90 degree bends at the elbows, thighs brought parallel with the ground, and toes pulled towards the shins. It is important that an athlete be able to smoothly perform the rhythmic motion of A skips because it mimics much of the positioning needed for high speed, efficient sprinting. Over and under the fence is an exercise designed to loosen the hips and groin for lateral movement and change of direction speed. This exercise is performed by first stepping laterally over an imaginary fence with both legs and then sliding under another imaginary fence. Note that the athlete's feet never cross at any point during this drill. As athletes step over the imaginary fence, 
They aim to step as high as possible, thus striving for maximum range of motion in the hips. Similarly, as the athlete slides under the imaginary fence, they should step as wide as possible and sink as low as possible to fully stretch the groins and hamstring. The backwards open hip skip focuses on rhythm and aims to loosen the hips and groin. Here the athlete will lift their thigh parallel to the ground in front of their body, then rotate it open as they step backwards. As the athlete steps backwards, they should imagine that they are stepping over a small hurdle. As with all speed training exercises, athletes should keep all of their weight on the front of their foot and keep their heels off the ground. By keeping their weight on the front of their feet, athletes will more easily fall into a rhythm that allows them to smoothly perform this challenging exercise. When performing the lunge and twist, athletes will step forward with their right leg and sink down towards the ground until their opposite knee comes within about an inch of the ground. Once in the lunge position, the athlete will rotate their left elbow towards their right knee. This is an unstable position requiring strength, flexibility, and balance. From this position, the athlete will step with their left leg all the way from the trail position to the lunge position out front. This should all be done in one step. Athletes should not take any additional steps in between. After athletes have performed drills in this warm-up routine a couple of times, it should take them no longer than about six to eight minutes to complete. As with all the exercises on this video, if you need further clarification of any of the warm-ups, please refer to your training manual. The most basic quick foot ladder exercise is called one foot runs. This drill simply involves running through the ladder and placing one foot in each hole. The key is to keep the upper and lower body in sync with one another. As the right foot steps forward, the right elbow fires backwards and vice versa. It is of utmost importance for the athlete to perfectly place each of their steps as they move through the ladder. Perfection is the number one goal, with speed being the number two goal. Many exercises on the quick foot ladder can also be performed while holding hand weights or while being resisted by the viper. Both of these techniques serve to increase the level of difficulty of the drill and should be mixed into your daily workout plans. Two foot ladder runs are performed exactly the same way as one foot ladder runs, except that both feet step into each hole. This requires shorter, quicker motions and more body control. Athletes must still fight to keep their upper and lower bodies in rhythm. The tendency will be for athletes to accelerate forward and miss holes in the ladder. However, athletes must avoid this by focusing on correct patterns, driving their elbows backwards, and on forcing their feet to quickly pop off the ground. Brake runs combine the motions of one foot runs and two foot runs on the quick foot ladder. As with the motions it combines, the key to this motion is to maintain perfect rhythm between the upper and lower body during the full repetition. Brake runs are performed using one foot runs through the first half of the ladder and then quickly and smoothly shifting to the motions of two foot runs for the second half. The challenge here is for the athlete to channel all the forward momentum they build up while performing one foot runs into their feet when they switch to two foot runs. This is a tricky transition and requires supreme body control. The Icky Shuffle is one of the best drills that can be performed on the quick foot ladder. This drill focuses solely on rhythm and rapid fire foot contacts. The Icky Shuffle involves placing both feet inside the ladder and one foot on either side. While it is possible to generate blistering foot speed on this exercise, you must be patient enough to learn the correct foot pattern before you step on the gas. There is a direct correlation between an athlete's sprint speed and the rate of turnover in their upper body. In short, the faster an athlete can move their elbows, the faster they are going to run. Athletes can isolate this skill by performing hand weight drops in place. When performing this exercise, the athlete will simply hold a buckshot weight in each hand, position their feet shoulder width apart, and set themselves in a comfortable crouched position. The athlete will then quickly perform the same motion with their arms as they use during a sprint. Arms should be locked at a 90 degree bend. The hands should move from roughly the hip pocket up to no higher than the nose. And the primary focus should be on the force of the elbow firing backwards. 
As soon as the athlete has performed 8 to 12 full speed repetitions on each arm, they will drop the hand weights and immediately perform an equal number of free repetitions. Running hand weight drops are unmatched in developing a powerful upper body for the acceleration portion of your sprint. When performing this exercise, the athlete will grip a pair of hand weights. The athlete will then perform a full speed sprint for the given distance and drop the hand weights at the halfway point of the sprint. When the athlete drops the hand weights, their upper body should fire faster, causing a turbo boost in speed for the second half of the sprint. The key is to maintain form and body control during this quick transition from a resisted to free upper body. Tag sprints are an excellent drill for developing acceleration skills. They are also extremely fun and can be performed in dozens of variations. Every version of tag sprints involves one athlete sprinting to cross a designated finish line before a trailing athlete can tag them on the back. Tag sprints begin by separating two athletes by a given distance so that the lead athlete has a head start. However, the lead athlete is required to start from a position that is more difficult than the one used by the trail athlete. For example, the lead athlete may be required to start from a seated position where their legs are extended straight out front and flat on the ground, while the trail athlete begins from a standing position. Any combination of standing, seated, lying, and backward starting positions may be used. The key is to choose starting positions and spacing that result in a very close finish at the finish line. If your first repetition results in one athlete completely blowing the other away, then adjust the starting positions accordingly on the next repetition to balance out the differences in ability. Just as resistance can be used to train top speed, so can assistance. The technique of assisting an athlete through a sprint is known as overspeed, and the best way to conduct an overspeed sprint is with a device known as a rocket rope. The rocket rope is a three-man training tool that essentially slingshots one of the athletes through a 30-yard sprint. Overspeed sprinting requires perfect technique and trains an athlete's neuromuscular system to be fast. The rocket rope requires one athlete to serve as the anchor, one to serve as the engine, and one to act as the rabbit. The athletes begin in a triangle configuration with the engine at the top of the triangle and the anchor and the rabbit standing next to one another at the bottom of the triangle. The engine athlete will initiate the drill by looking back at the rabbit and asking if they are ready. Once the rabbit gives the okay, the engine athlete will run full speed for a given distance. The physics of the rocket rope caused the rabbit to experience a tremendous overspeed pull for the duration of the sprint. The engine athlete will stop once they have reached the point marking the end of their sprint. The rabbit will sprint past the engine and coast to a stop. The anchor will release the handle once the rabbit gets to within five yards of the engine. A simple and effective hopping exercise on the quick foot ladder is hopscotch. Hopscotch is performed by placing both feet in the first hole and then hopping forward to the second hole and placing the feet outside the ladder on either side. This motion is then repeated for the full length of the ladder. The idea is to stay low and quick while keeping all of the body's weight on the front of the foot. Like many other ladder drills, this is one that can also be performed by using the resistance or assistance of the Viper. When performing straddle hops, athletes will place one foot in the first hole and one foot outside the first hole. Athletes' feet should be slightly wider than shoulder width apart. In a quick hopping motion, athletes will move to the second hole and reverse the position of their feet. The goal is to maintain a wide base position and to minimize the time spent on the ground. This drill is unmatched in quickly teaching an athlete the proper body positioning necessary for producing a smothering defensive performance. Straddle hops are yet another example of a quick foot ladder drill that can be performed backwards or with the resistance of a viper. Another quick foot ladder drill that will prepare an athlete for a power day workout is jump cuts. The athlete will start by placing both feet in the first hole and then hopping out beside the second hole. This pattern is then repeated for the full length of the ladder. 
As the athlete performs this exercise, they should concentrate on keeping their feet together and having them strike the ground at the exact same time. Athletes should keep a slight bend in their knees and their weight on the front of their feet to achieve maximum speeds. One of the more difficult hopping drills that can be performed on the quick foot ladder is the crazy climber. This exercise is excellent for loosening an athlete's hips and torso as well as for developing smooth total body rhythm. Athletes should keep their weight on the front of their feet and quickly pop off the ground with each contact. For an illustration of the crazy climber's foot pattern, please refer to the Sack Attack training manual. One of the most simple and effective exercises for developing explosive power necessary for sprinting is frog leaps. Frog leaps simply involve performing a given number of leaps over a maximum distance. The time spent on the ground should be minimized and the athlete should pick up momentum with each jump. Athletes should focus on coordinating the forward thrust of the hips and hands with each leap. It is helpful to mark the landing point of the final jump so the athlete will have a goal to beat with each successive set. To help build explosive single leg power, athletes will perform bounding. Like frog leaps, bounding involves performing a given number of bounds over a maximum distance. With each bound, the athlete will power off the ground with one leg, glide in the air as long as possible, and then land on the opposite leg. Russian leaps is a resisted jumping exercise that will help athletes develop an explosive start to any sprint. This exercise is conducted by having a training partner anchor the Viper's flexicord to the ground with their foot. As the athlete is resisted towards the ground, they will perform a quick set of jumps for maximum height. As soon as the athlete completes the resisted jumps, they will immediately remove the Viper belt and perform an equal number of free jumps. Russian skips are set up the same way as Russian leaps, but rather than performing resisted leaps, athletes will be resisted through the motions of A skips, just like they performed during the warm-up routine. Each skip should be quick and precise, and should be powerful enough that the athlete completely separates from the ground with each explosive push. Just as when performing A skips, athletes should concentrate on driving their elbows backwards and their knees upward to approximately waist level. After the athlete has performed the required number of resisted skips, they will remove the Viper's belt and immediately perform a free sprint. The exact distance of this sprint will be indicated in the daily workout plans in the Sack Attack training manual. Let goes are similar to running hand weight drops, except that the athlete's entire body is resisted instead of just their upper body. When performing this exercise, athletes will use the padded Viper waist belt and the handle attachment. Athletes will start in a three-point stance and perform a full speed sprint for the given distance. The athlete will use a coach or training partner to resist their sprint for the first half. At the halfway point of the sprint, the coach or training partner will release the handle and allow the athlete to sprint unimpeded for the second half. The athlete should react to, rather than anticipate, the release of the handle. At the point of release, the athlete should feel a tremendous increase in speed and should continue to accelerate through the end of the marked distance. One of the best exercises for developing the total body power needed to run fast is the caber toss. This exercise is performed using a weighted ball. The weight used will depend on the athlete, but remember that it is the speed of the motion that is of primary importance, so a lighter ball is typically preferred. The athlete will start with the ball extended above their head and their feet slightly wider than shoulder width. The athlete will let the weight of the ball swing down and back until it pulls them into a crouched, loaded position. At the moment the ball reaches the bottom of the swing, the athlete will immediately hit the ignition switch, actively reverse the motion of the ball, and launch it directly above their head. The goal is to throw the ball straight up in the air as high as possible. As soon as the ball hits the ground, the athlete will catch it, reload, and throw again. The heave and retrieve exercise combines an explosive throw with a quick sprint. For this drill, the athlete will use a weighted ball. The athlete will place the ball directly under their chin and begin in a coiled up crouch position, 
the athlete will initiate the throw by forcefully leaping forward and simultaneously bench pressing the ball off their chest. As soon as the athlete's feet return to the ground, they will sprint after the ball, reload, and perform the rest of their throws. Not only is this drill great for developing explosive speed, but it's also a great conditioning exercise. This drill is typically placed towards the end of workouts because it's likely to burn up any remaining gas that may be left in the athlete's tank. The reverse caver toss is a combination of the caver toss and the heave and retrieve drills. The athlete will go through the exact same motions used in the caver toss, except that at the point of release, the athlete will continue to thrust his hips forward, arch his back, and throw the ball as high and as far backwards as possible. After the ball has been released, the athlete will then take a quick drop step, turn towards the ball, and sprint after it. Athletes should only graduate to the reverse caber toss after they have mastered the motions of the regular caber toss. Remember, the speed of motion is of primary importance, so the weight of the ball can be relatively light. This exercise is performed with the athlete holding a weighted jelly ball and lying on his back. The two main variations of this drill involve the athlete throwing the ball from the waist to over the head, or from over the head and then towards the feet. In both cases, after the ball is thrown, the athlete will explode off the ground and sprint after the ball. The idea here is to have the athlete generate as much force as possible from the torso and midsection during the throw, and then be able to quickly recover from the task of the throw and transition into a short sprint. The lateral run is much like the two-foot runs performed on the linear workout days, except that the athlete is moving sideways. The front foot always steps in first, and the back foot always trails. Since this drill involves a lateral motion, athletes must be sure to perform equal repetitions to both the right and the left. Like with other ladder drills, it is important to start the foot pattern slow and then gradually increase the speed. The buzz saw is a great exercise for lateral and change of direction speed. The pattern of this drill has the athlete step into the first hole of the ladder with his lead foot and then step into the same square with his trail foot. The athlete then quickly steps back out with his lead foot and then with the trail foot. The athlete moves laterally and repeats the pattern on the next hole. Because this is an exercise that involves lateral movement, equal repetitions must be performed to both the left and the right. The double step icky shuffle is performed the same way as the regular icky shuffle from the linear speed day workouts except for one variation. Athletes will begin by stepping laterally into the ladder with both feet. Then, rather than stepping out to the side with only one foot, athletes will step out with both feet. This one simple additional step is enough to confuse even the most skilled athletes. Just like when athletes are first taught the regular icky shuffle, this version of the drill should be performed at a very slow pace. Refer to your sack attack training manual for a diagram of the foot pattern used for this drill. This drill is nothing more than the regular icky shuffle except that it is performed laterally. An athlete will perform this drill by stepping into the first square of the ladder with his lead foot and then into the same square with his trail foot. The athlete then steps outside and on top of the second hole with his lead foot and then into the second hole with his trail foot. The lead foot then steps into the second hole and the trail foot is placed outside the second hole. It may help to visualize this pattern by keeping in mind that both feet always step into the ladder but only the lead foot ever steps outside the top of the ladder and only the trail foot steps outside the bottom of the ladder. Another important point to remember when performing this drill is that the athlete must begin with their lead foot. If the athlete is moving to their right, then their right foot is their lead foot. If the athlete is moving through the ladder to their left, then their left foot is their lead foot. The 45 degree hand weight drop exercise is designed to teach athletes to accelerate out of cuts. In the sport of baseball, this drill is primarily used to aid base runners as they make hard left turns rounding first, second, or third base. 
This drill is set up by marking a pathway with cones. The pathway should consist of a 10-yard straightaway, then a 45-degree bend, and another 10-yard straightaway. The athlete should aim to sprint the first straightaway as fast as possible, drop the hand weights in the bend, and then sprint the final straightaway. After the athlete drops the hand weights, their arms turn over much faster than before, and they experience a turbo boost in their sprint. By causing this increase in speed to take place at the same moment as the cut, athletes learn to control their body during high-speed breaks, and the athlete's body and mind begin to associate changing direction with higher sprint speeds. The sandwich drill is set up by placing an athlete between two cones spaced about five yards apart. The athlete will either use a sidewinder around their ankles or a viper around their waist with the flexicord stretched out to their left or right. A coach or training partner is then positioned with 10 to 12 tennis balls a few yards in front of the athlete. The coach will toss the tennis balls in the space between the two cones. It is the job of the athlete to use proper lateral slide mechanics to prevent any of the balls from getting past. The athlete should aim to knock down each ball by using both hands to ensure maximum lateral movement. Once again, note that the sandwich drill can be performed with either the Viper or the Sidewinder. While the Sidewinder provides resistance to the athlete's lower body, the Viper provides resistance to the athlete's entire body. Both are excellent training techniques and should be mixed in throughout a total training routine. Lateral let goes involve the use of the padded Viper waist belt and the Viper handle attachment. A training partner will be used in this drill to provide the resistance. Here the handle and the training partner are placed to the left of the athlete. The athlete will move laterally to his right by pushing with his left leg and alternately pulling with his right leg. The resistance provided should be heavy enough so the athlete knows it is there, but light enough so that he may use proper slide mechanics. At the mark of the first cone, the partner will let go of the handle. The athlete must sense the release, then quickly snap his hips around and perform a linear sprint. The Sidewinder Hop Drill is used to develop a powerful knee lift, explosive lateral skills, and extreme body control. The athlete will begin this drill by driving their knee up towards their chest and hopping laterally over an imaginary fence. Driving the knee upward causes the athlete's feet to separate, placing more tension on the Sidewinder's flexicord and thus making it more difficult for the athlete to maintain positioning. As the athlete hops over the imaginary fence, he must also make sure that his trail foot is clearing the fence as well. Upon landing, the athlete will only allow the lead foot to touch the ground. The athlete will quickly balance on this foot and then reverse the motion with the trail foot changing roles and becoming the lead foot. At the end of workouts, athletes will go through a short period of cooling down. During this period, athletes will address areas of core strength and flexibility. Core strength drills target the muscles in the stomach and lower back. These muscles play a major role in any motion that requires total body explosion. The flexibility section is placed at the end of workouts because this is when the body is completely warmed up and loose and thus most receptive to gains in flexibility. The first exercise an athlete may choose to perform for their core strength is the dead horse crunch. This exercise targets the abdominal muscles. Athletes simply lie on their backs, extend their arms and legs straight up in the air, and reach up towards their toes. The dead horse crunch can be performed in sets of 25 to 100 repetitions. To increase the difficulty of this exercise, a weighted ball may be added. Catapult throws also address the abdominal muscles, but in a much more explosive manner. This exercise is performed with a partner and a weighted ball. The athlete will begin by holding the ball above their head and will keep their arms in a locked position. As the athlete goes through the motions of a sit-up, they will release the ball at the top of the sit-up and throw it at their partner's head. The partner will catch the ball and toss it back just above the head of the athlete as they return to the bottom of the sit-up. We recommend doing catapult throws in sets of 10 to 25 repetitions. Performing leg throws is another great way to address abdominal strength. As the athlete lies on their back, 
They will brace themselves by holding their partner's ankles. The athlete should keep their legs locked and raise them straight up in the air. The partner will grab the athlete's ankles and forcefully throw them towards the ground. As the athlete becomes more proficient with this exercise, they may have their partner throw their legs randomly to the middle, left, and right as shown here. Equally as important as having strong, explosive abdominal muscles is having a strong, explosive lower back. One exercise we use to target this area is the seal catch. When performing this exercise, the athlete will lie face down with their partner kneeling three feet in front of them with a weighted ball. As the partner tosses the ball just above the athlete's head, the athlete will use the muscles in their lower back to raise up, catch the ball, and immediately toss it back to their partner. Seal catches can be performed in sets of 6 to 12 repetitions. After an athlete has strengthened their lower back by performing seal catches, they may then proceed to seal throws. Seal throws again involve the use of a weighted ball. Here the athlete will lay flat on their stomach, hold the ball in front of their head, and throw the ball as high and as far behind them as possible without bending their arms. The athlete's upper body and feet will leave the ground during the throw, and the muscles in their lower back will quickly contract to execute the throw. This drill can be stressful on the lower back, so a lighter ball should be used. To end each workout, athletes will perform 5 to 10 minutes of stretching. An excellent way to enhance post-workout stretching is to perform the four partner stretches we will demonstrate here. The idea is to take advantage of the natural looseness the body experiences at the end of workouts by using a coach or training partner to push the athlete through a wider range of motions than they are capable of performing on their own. In all of the stretches, the athlete will lie on their back. First, the partner or coach will place their chest on the athlete's foot and push the athlete's knee towards their chin. As soon as the athlete has reached their comfortable limit, they will say stop and the partner will hold this position for 10 seconds. In the next stretch, the athlete will extend their legs straight up in the air and lock their knee. The partner will stretch the athlete's hamstring by pushing back on their leg. Again, the athlete must say stop when they have reached their maximum stretch position. The athlete must communicate when they reach their limit so the partner does not unintentionally overstretch them. After holding stretch number two for 10 seconds, the partner will then push the athlete's knee towards their armpit. The athlete's thigh should end up roughly parallel to the ground, and their lower leg should end up roughly perpendicular to the ground. As with other partner stretches, the athlete should relax and allow their body to stretch through a full range of motion. In the final stretch, the athlete will rotate their leg across their body. The partner will press down on the athlete's thigh while holding their opposite shoulder to the ground. The athlete will find it helpful to exhale all of their breath when performing this stretch. By properly stretching at the end of each workout, athletes will prevent soreness and potential injury, as well as increase flexibility, thus increasing movement speeds. In this video, we have demonstrated all the drills you will use with your athletes to develop explosive team speed. In the SAC Attack Training Manual, you will find a detailed plan for a three-day-a-week, six-week training routine. The manual provides you with photos, charts, and setup diagrams for each of your daily workouts and further information on each of the drills you have seen on this video. If you carefully implement this training system with your team, you will create an army of lightning-fast players capable of wreaking havoc on your opponents at every point of the competition. Good luck with your training! And please contact us at Speed City if we can be a further assistance to you.